Welcome back to another advertisement episode for Laser Guggenland. <coughs> uh, it's reachable under lgl.silium.com and it's a Anarchy Vanilla server. And yeah, if you're interested um, about more details, what the server is and so on, um, just watch any other video on this channel. <coughs> I usually take quite some time explaining what the server is and, all, and, uh, and stuff, but I don't feel like right now. So just watch any other video and I'm going to play back a talk um, from the DEF CON conference now. Um, it's a <coughs> YouTube video from 2015, it's uploaded on the channel DEF CON conference and um, it has the title DEF CON uh, 23 Jason Haddix, oh that name sounds uh, familiar. Maybe I know that talk already. Or oh, it's been lying in my watch later playlist since forever and I feel like familiar with it already. I don't know. Um, Jason Haddix, uh, how to shot web, web and mobile hacking in 2015. Um, I, I didn't know that there was like web and mobile already in 2015. Well, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, the web was there for sure and mobile is when did mobile start? When when did it became a, like a, a mainstream thing? Was it like 2015? I think it was already prior to 2010, right? I mean, yeah. I don't know. Um, it like for me, smartphones uh, still so like such a new thing. Um, boy, I'm getting old. Um, I don't know. Um, yeah. So if you're interested in the talk, um, make sure to check out the original and if you're interested in this Minecraft server where you can play Anarchy in uh, vanilla, the latest version, then uh, check out lgl.azilium.com. There are not many players, but that's um, yeah, that could also be seen as an advantage, so nobody will bother you. Okay, cool. Let's get started and uh, is, we're going uh, to watch the talk. Web, better web hacking and mobile hacking in 2015. I know oh, Dan Fancy is talking right now, so I really appreciate everyone being here. He's way smarter than me. So uh, This is me. I work for BugCrowd. I'm the director of technical operations. Uh, I manage a team of hackers who validates the bugs behind the scenes of a bug bounty, large-scale bug bounty program. Um, in 2014, I participated as only a researcher. I didn't work for them yet. Uh, and this talk is about uh, my methodology that I used there to do web hacking, uh, as well as a little bit of mobile stuff, as well as stuff I learned from other researchers while doing this work. So w what is this really about? It's just how to hack stuff better and practically. Um, and I put a lot of memes, and some of them are not funny, apparently, my wife says, so it's okay. Um, so more specifically, what I did is I started off with my methodology, which was a normal pen tester methodology when I started doing this work, a, you know, basic web application assessment. And um, so I then went out and manually parsed out all of the public researchers of all the badass bug bounty hunters I knew. So it was about 150 people that I knew just around the titter, Twitter scene, not Titter scene, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, Twitter scene, as well as uh, people I just knew who were good at it, right? And so. I went through every single article they had ever written from um, from the beginning of the uh, crowdsourced bug bounty scene, um, and, and also all of the Google and Facebook programs that I could find, like you know, enterprise-based bug bounty stuff. And I created a presentation around what I distilled around that knowledge. So this is uh, kind of the stuff that I'm going to bring in this presentation: um, philosophy shifts from doing bug bounty testing to you know, from web app testing, you know, from traditional web app testing, uh, discovery techniques. Mapping methodology, parameters, often attack, useful fuzz strings, uh, bypass or filter evasion techniques, and um, some tooling that I think is cooler than other tooling. So. Uh, cool. So the first section is philosophy. Um, so the differences between kind of bug bounty hunting and being a web pen tester. Um, you know, I'm not really to argue this debate. There's a lot of people who feel strongly about both sides, and they're both right, honestly. Um, but but when you get down to the practical work. You introduce a lot of stuff here. You introduce uh, time uh, onto a security tester, right? They're they're not used to competition when they're doing this kind of stuff, unless you're playing in a CTF, which you know you're used to that. I played in some CTFs, so I was kind of used to it. Um, you know, you're only you're only incentivizing it in one side for uh, what you what you find, and not the hours you put in. So, I mean, this is a basic overview of how they differ, but the talk's more about the technical stuff. But um, 
But yeah, you, you basically tailor your methodology based around finding stuff in the 20% as opposed to the 80% across application assessment. So we'll go into how that 80-20 rule kind of fits uh, in the rest of the slides. So if you're doing regular web app assessment, you're following these two Bibles, right? The OWASP Tester's Guide or the Web Application Hacker's Handbook. This is usually what you're trained from and what your internal methodologies are built off of at almost any of the good consultancies. Um, and the authors are, you know, super great testers, right? But these take you from A to Z, um, and, you know, even though they find good bugs, they take a long time to complete in their full scale. So bug bounties are different. Um, so if you want to do web hacking and you want to get started, these are what you go for. Um, but my, my talk is a little bit different. So let's talk about discovery in uh, web application assessment for a bounty. So what you want to do in a bug bounty is basically find the road less traveled. And this is if you're aiming to get paid, I think. Um, so you can attack the flagship application that the company has, right? But really, that's not where the vulnerabilities are going to be most of the time. That application has been tested by a pen test team. It's probably had a bug bounty on it for a long time. What you really want to find is the parts of the applications that are like subdomains or uh, maybe obscure web servers on different ports. Uh, you want to find acquisitions that maybe the company has had recently that came in from a different development team. Um, and, uh, and they might have a whole slew of problems that came from a whole different group. Uh, you want to look at functionality changes and redes redesigns on uh, sites, mobile websites, because they're you're set to render differently on your phone, um, and also new mobile app versions when you're testing. Um, so we're going to go into some tools and stuff I use to find a new surface area for you to attack. So Recon NG, Recon NG is this tool that uh, basically allows you to do a whole bunch of automated OSINT stuff. And one part of it is it has all these modules to do subdomain brute forcing and subdomain discovery. Now, uh, subdomain discovery is a big part of, of finding, you know, applications that have been left out there. I mean, marketing spins up a site, you know, dev spins up a test site, like you have like integration stuff left up. So um, finding those and hacking those and getting RCE or code execution through those sites is, is kind of where um, you can get big payouts. So this script, what it does is it iteratively scrapes Google for all subdomains on a given uh, a given web property. So let's say acme.com. This will find, um, this will scrape Google for everything that is in acme, dub, 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 acme .com, and then iteratively remove those results until you're down to this long list of subdomains. It also scrapes Bing, Baidu, Netcraft, and Brute Force's subdomains like your common fierce tool would. Uh, so this is on GitHub. It's a simple shells wrapper around Recon NG, so you need to have Recon NG installed. If you use Kali Linux, um, you can just uh, pop the script in and go. Um, yeah, so this is the output of something like that against a company like this. Um, you can see there's a lot of output, probably a lot of domains here that have gone under assessed as far as you go. So This is that idea of iterating through Google to find subdomains. So here you have site and then minus dub 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 site. And then I found on the first hit was sandbox, so I removed that on the next run through. And this is that scraping that's happening that the tool is doing. And then you get more entries floating to the top. So you get uh, credit apply, or business, or shopping, or advertising. And you just keep on removing these until you have all of them. Uh, and then you group force, and then you end up with a huge list of, of sites to assess. And then you want to go through, uh, and on your, you know, on your entity that you're attacking, um, you want to find any you know, mergers or acquisitions that maybe aren't the domain that you're given, right? But they just have purchased a company, right? So Oculus. Um, you know, purchased by Facebook, had some bugs, and uh, they got popped as soon as they were acquired, and they were not under the Facebook, um, like, six-month rule, or, I don't know if it's Facebook six-month, or I can't remember how long, but, um, yeah, they got popped immediately, right? And that was a whole different dev team, but owned by Facebook, and worthy for an RCE bug. They got hit with SQL injection and a custom header, and that was great. So. Well, not great, but it, it was good for the, the bounty. So, uh, yeah. So Wikipedia for Facebook and Google does this really well. People update these, these things all the time when there's an acquisition for like stock reasons, right? So keep an eye on these. Um, if your company has you know, purchased something else and they have some new domain and it might not be in the bug bounty brief yet, you can go after this if you're doing those types of bounties. There's also a, a repository um, of links of every 
kind of bomb that's come out on Facebook and PayPal and Google. Um, people like to share this information. This one's hosted on Facebook. I have no idea why. Um, the link's in there, and the slides uh, have a big hyperlink, so you can go check it out. But these are all the blog articles that reference bugs here. Now, why is this important if somebody else has already found these bugs? Um, because bugs get represented across the domain in different places. So you can tell a lot about an organization once you read these articles and find the same bug in other locations, like those subdomains you found, maybe rogue web servers and things like that. It also kind of tells you what they're going to do to fix them, like how they filtered out input. Uh, you get a lot of intel around the application. So, you know, really doing a lot of research on your target um, can help, uh, but it's not the fast stuff. So, uh, so port scanning, I mentioned port scanning. So port scanning is not just for NetPen. Um, so, yeah, I mean, how I hacked Facebook, there was an article by Ryan Zuhurst who was like, I started up port scanning and found some weird server, which was a Jenkins script console with no auth. And that was it. He got in. Like, <laughs> simple as that, right? Like, uh, eight thousand dollar bug or something like that, right? Like, uh, or even more. I don't remember. Um, so, is.net, the Microsoft domain that you know evangelizes.net, had RDP open to the world with MS twelve o twenty on it, uh, vulnerable, and so that was a thing. So yeah, just go ahead and you know use a simple nmap syntax to start you know uh, support scanning all of your sites and. Make sure you check all those services. This syntax will port scan, uh, port scan for all ports uh, on a domain, as well as uh, pull out any HTTP servers titles and display those in the output. Um, it also it's a sin scan and OS fingerprint stuff like that too. So mapping. So map. So you you found all of these new servers, right? Like uh, maybe subdomains, or maybe you found an acquisition or something like that. And now you want to move into um, you want to move into mapping an individual application. So and taking notes is really important when you're doing this, whether you're doing it inside of like a uh, like a notepad or you know just using pen and paper or like Evernote. I use Evernote. All my all my bugs are templatized, so when I find them, I can just copy and paste into the disclosure email or whatever like that. So, um, so these are some mapping tips that I use right away. So Google is actually your friend, right? You can get a lot of parameter information from just googling a domain and figure out like what happens there. I know there's some like parameter parsing scripts. I couldn't find a really good one for this presentation. Um, but you know, just we'll parse parameters out of the Google uh, like, you know, cache stuff. Um, but really the next the next big thing is directory reporting, right? Finding unlinked content, content that's not supposed to be there. Um, so a lot of people use like Durbuster or content discovery and burp for this kind of thing. And that's good. They're they're good lists. Um, but those lists were created by going out and spidering the internet. Um, and finding you know every path after the top level domain and then prioritizing them. Um, there's some other lists that are better for this type of work. So uh, the raft lists are these lists that came out of a talk maybe four or five years ago. A raft was an application proxy. It was a decent one, but it's since been discontinued. But its lists have uh, for directory reinforcing have lived on. They are. Um, they are a spider of the internet's robot docs text files. So everything that everybody doesn't want you to see is in this directory group forcing list. Um, so it's super sick. I can't tell you how many bugs I found just using this list. Like config files, badly configured to get you know, stuff. It's, it's just all over the place. SVN Digger is another list like this. They went out and spidered all the SVN projects. So if your project, if your site or your target is an open source place, you can use the you can take all the paths that have been converted for you to directory reports to get better application coverage or find config files. Uh, Git Digger is the same thing for Git. So, um, so after you do some unlinked content discovery or directory reporting, whatever you want to call it, you move on to trying to identify your platform. Um, so there's just some really simple wins here. Wrap, Wappalizer and Built With are Chrome extensions that you can just click, and they will give you pretty much the whole stack by looking at the, uh, the headers, the comments in the pages, the way they render, like uh, analytics things that have been integrated, and they'll just give you like the whole server stack, and they'll even give you version numbers if they can identify them. So, Wappalizer and Built With are super sick. Um, Retire.js is one of my new favorites. Uh, it will profile all of the server side JavaScript libraries and tell you if they're out of date as well. Uh, as give you all the vulnerabilities um, before that um, that patch or you know your vulnerable version has, so you'll get a list of prioritized uh, cross-site scripting or whatever is, is in jQuery at the time, right? And then once you identify all of these servers' uh, version numbers, you just go check for CVEs and you know server-side stuff. So that's pretty standard. That's that's web stuff. Um, but these are some good tools. 
Now, if you happen to come across a CMS, which is like the pen testers train, because those things suck and the plugins suck, um, you want to use these two tools. Uh, WP Scan for WordPress, a lot of people use this already. It will identify uh, all plugins and users for a WordPress install, as well as look up any volumes that are associated with those plugins that have been disclosed. And then CMS map for, uh, for Drupal and um, what is the other CMS? Drupal and Joomla. There you go. Thank you. Awesome. So, so those are the two that uh, have really yielded any value for me across um, CMS. So here you see a screenshot of uh, screenshot of WP Scan, and um, it's you know found a version of a plugin or a theme that already has like cross site script or a file upload vulnerability in it. Sometimes there's false positives, but honestly, you, for what this script does, it provides so much value. To this um, so the directory group forcing we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, I mean the workflow for this a lot of people do, but I just put the slide in here because I see a lot of people do it a little bit weird. I see people brute force like off the top level path a lot and then just stop, right? And so they'll get some errors and they don't know what to do with it. Um, so they'll, they'll go to acne.com and get a 200. And then they'll go to a backlog and they'll get a 404 and they'll get more 404s and more 404s and you just know there's nothing there. But then they'll hit like control panel and see a 401. And then they'll be like, well, I can't do anything that I'm not authorized, right? So they don't brute force after control panel. There's so many like messed up access control on web server bugs that you can exploit. If you just brute force after that, you'll probably find something. So I, I just see this a lot where people stop after the top level domain when they're doing directory you know, enumeration. So that's kind of the workflow you're doing there. Um, some other things that you can do is, is mapping and vuln discovery using open source intelligence. So these are uh, one, two, three, four, five, five sites, six, six methods that you can use to find already published bugs or almost already public bugs, I mean, I guess. I'm pretty sure I've seen the talk already. I mean, or like someone like describing the same tools and using the same memes, which is also possible. Um, but yeah. <laughs> They're considered like end day or whatever. Um, but uh, XSS.com, Reddit XSS, Punk Spider is actually a BERT engine that just scans the internet. So if, you're, if your target is a high profile site, information might already be in here for your test and you can pull it out and use it to your advantage even if those bugs have already been disclosed and I've found bugs that were on here but not disclosed with the customer through the bounty so that's actually worked before it was like a super easy win um, they help you get a feeling for what the company has faced before as far as issues like prevalent cross-site scripting cross-site request forgery you know, file upload and, and then you can do regression testing on all the domains that you found earlier in the presentation so um, yeah, go out and use these resources to try to find bugs uh, in the platform as quickly as possible because they're free and they're already out there. And the customer should know about them anyway. It's the responsible thing to do. Okay, so this is my intern, Ben. He's uh, never spoken before at DEF CON. Neither have I actually seen my first time uh, speaking. But uh, he did an awesome project and he's going to talk about it for a couple of seconds. I really gathered um, a bunch of JSON files that include all uh, the metadata for each bug bounty program that's out there. So there's 250 plus bounty programs that are included in this project and they all include information like uh, how much the minimum bounty is, how much the maximum is, what uh, mobile apps are included, what web apps uh, are included, what's not included in the scope of the program as well. And we actually use all this data and fit it into different scripts like uh, you see on the screen, we put it into Knock, and it just went through all the, every single one of those uh, programs and brute force them for uh, stopping it. And this also is available on a uh, GitHub account, and everyone could go and to, uh, use it if they want to. Um, so the JSON files look similar to this. This is Yahoo's program uh, a couple months ago. If that updated, we don't know. But what we have is a DNS record that shows that's the Yahoo.com itself and all subdomains of it and Flickr and all supplements of Flickr are included in the scope, as well as all the mobile apps that are included in the scope as well. And as you can see in the bottom, there is two sub uh, two domains, which is Yahoo.net and its subdomains, and Yahoo.net itself not being included in the scope of the program. 
So what we ended up doing with this, using Ruby, we wrote a script, we fed every single one of the JSON, file, JSON files, and we crawled them. And using grep, we, for a sample for this one, we grep the direct, and you can see there was a, we couldn't disclose the domain, but there's a bunch of sub sites that are out there that have to be direct out there that you can easily report and take them out and report to the vendor. Taking it further, we, um, same idea, we use all the JSON files, and we fit that into Intrigue, which Intrigue is a API framework that, uh, that is for intelligence gathering, and it does a bunch of tasks that you can see on the right, uh, left side of the screen. It includes doing supplement brute force, web slider, end map, and you name it, we can do it with Intrigue. So uh, also Intrigue is available on GitHub as well, it's open source, go ahead and work it and commit to it if you need to. Um, what we ended up doing for Intrigue is we parsed every single JSON file with help of Ruby, and you can see at the line when it says R, we are taking a task which is called DNS sub, uh, DNS root sub, which is a supplement brute forcer, and we're going to give it an entity and then options that are all included in the manual, and we are running that for a JSON file, which at the bottom shows it's being assigned an ID. That you can just go on your local host and check it out and see what Intrigue has found. So, for example, we did Intrigue IO, and for DNS brute force, you can see all those subdomains that have been out there uh, that Intrigue found with their IP addresses as well. And make sure you guys check it out. It's like I said, it's online, and you guys could do the, the, the possibilities that are it's fine. You can do whatever you can think of out there with those. And being a bug bounty hunter, I think it's a uh, Awesome. Yeah, that's that's a sick tool and a sick framework, both mapping and recon entry. Like, uh, I mean, if you've used Foca and Maltigo and everything like that, it's like an open source version of those license tools. I love both those tools, by the way. Just saying, like, um, use them both if you can. But uh, but Intrigue is going to be sick. You guys should check it out. Um, okay, so on to where are we Auth and Session. I'm going to have to blow through some of this because this presentation is long and like there's a ton of stuff. Okay. So Auth-related bugs. The one thing I want to say about these, right, these are low, shallow bugs that everybody hates people to report in bug bounties. The problem is if people start not paying attention to them, you can't chain them to do bigger things, right? So we've had multiple bugs, or I've had multiple bugs where... Um, where we've had a couple small issues like with password resets or like, you know, something like that. And then we've chained them to make like a critical, critical account takeover bug. So these are really important, but these are the kind of bugs that a lot of people uh, see in like the hashtag like bag bounty instead of bug bounty. You know, people really don't like them. Don't discount them, just note them. And if you don't wanna, if they're out of scope, don't do anything with them, but you might be able to use them later. That's all I really have to say about, about some of these, so. Um, so session the science, the kind of same things, right? So failure to invalidate old cookies, like new cookies on login, or no new cookies on login and timeout, uh, never any cookie link. Like these are all things you're gonna be able to use later when you need to chain bugs, but a lot of times they're out of scope. So, um, either you're out of scope or unappreciated or doomed or something. Like that, so. But uh, but yeah, you should you should keep them in mind when you continue testing because they, they can be chained into bigger issues. So so the big part of this one is actually tactical fuzzing. Um, so. So I go through a couple different injection types or, or um, you know vulnerability types here, and so we're going to talk about cross-site scripting and some research that some really cool people have done. Um, so the core idea of cross-site scripting, right? Does the page functionality display uh, something to the users? Like you know that's kind of the question I ask myself. You know, can I get reflections somehow with JavaScript? Um, and so you can do manual testing, which is great, right? And you enter in your your meta characters and see if, you know if they return, but. Um, Really, when I'm trying to work fast on a bug bounty, I have three or four like magic strings that I use. And so um, you probably used them before. The, the technical definition for them is polyglot payloads. Uh, these are web polyglot payloads. And so the first one you'll probably recognize. This one is R snakes. They used to call it the R snake battering ram, or that's what I when I worked. Well, you need a lot of characters for that one though. Cheat sheet. You probably used this before. You put it into the search bar or comment field and then you pray that you get cross-site scripting, right? So this is the first one. This is actually a multi-context, filter bypass based polyglot web payload. Uh, it's a mouthful, I know. But basically it's designed to evade filters. Uh, it's allowed to execute in different web contexts. Um, and it's really cool. So I have three of these strings that I cite here that 
if you're just doing bug bounty hunting, you can use um, and just kind of move along on your on your critical functions on the site. So this one is from a researcher named uh, Shar Javed. He does uh, cross-site scripting research. Um, I think he did his PhD in cross-site scripting, which to me is like blows my mind. Um, so this is a multi-context filter bypass based polyglot as well. So um, you can see here that he's trying to to mark up in a whole bunch of different contexts. He's got like an, an like an at sign here to like trick uh, trick email like filters or you know maybe a formal takes email or something like that. So uh, he actually ran this along like the Alexa top 100 and like 80% of them were vulnerable to just their search parameters with this string. So um, you know more ammo for you guys doing bug bounties. This one is one by Matthias, uh, Matthias, Matthias Carlson, and is he here right now? Is Matthias here? Hey, there he is. He's awesome. Um, so he did a whole presentation on this idea of multi or uh, polyglot payloads on the website. So this is his multi-context polyglot pay payload, and so um, this is one that I use now. So thank you. Other XSS observations when I started parsing bug bounty work, as well as, as getting bugs myself. So. Finding in input vectors is important. So finding customizable three themes or profiles that use CSS, but then you can trick them into using JavaScript to execute cross-site scripting. Uh, a lot of names of like events or meetings in any application that deals with those types of things. Uh, URI-based URI uh, XSS is still a big thing when people pull things from the URI and render it for some reason. Um, importing from a third party, so think like Facebook integration where they're may maybe filtering characters, but your site actually displays Facebook data in line. Um, so you can set your name on Facebook to script alert and it will alert on this site. Um, JSON post values that didn't, uh, that didn't return the correct content type, so a lot of people discount web services right away because they think that uh, the content type won't, e won't execute cross-site scripting uh, or when it won't execute JavaScript. And so um, you have to really check and make sure they're returning the content type, otherwise you can get reflected XSS on a lot of web services like that. Uh, file upload names when you're uploading, I'll just try to change it to script alert or whatever like that. It's gonna echo that file name back usually a lot of places. Uploaded files themselves, this is a huge one actually that's all over the place. So a compiled Swift file or an HTML file that's designed to execute its own JavaScript and you uh, basically attack a file upload. So a lot of you know file uploads, there's a whole section here about file uploads, we'll talk about it more in a little bit. Uh, custom error pages where they're echoing out what you can't find, put SSS strings in there. Fake parameters where the page might parse some fake parameter data and put it into uh, into your response and then log in and forgot password forms. Also, this is a Swift parameter access. This is a huge thing as well. I, I don't think I've ever found a Swift file that I've decompiled that hasn't been vulnerable to either cross-site scripting or um, or uh, remote file include. Uh, and actually, Dennis here is like the guy I ask questions about all the time. So. Um, yeah, so these things are like JPlayer and like all of these like caught software that are Swift files that do like media or whatever. Like, um, so there's a whole OWASP page on um, on the common params that these players use, um, and then also the injection strings. But these you have to kind of do more manual analysis. So to do that manual analysis, I use this tool called Flashbang, which I think is super awesome. It's by Cure53. You drop it a Swift file on the other end comes out all of the parameters that might be vulnerable to cross-site scripting. It decompiles it for you and it displays them um, along with if they're going to execute out of the context of the Swift file. Uh, I highly suggest this tool if you're going to do some Swift hacking. It's way better than like a lot of the old ones. Cool, so SQL injection. Um, the core idea, does the page look like it might need to call on some stored data, obviously. This is Matias's um, SQLI polyglot, um, where it will execute in single quote, double quote, and straight into query context. Um, so I've seen a lot of cross-site scripting polyglots. And, and remember, these are things that actually scanners are starting to do, right? They don't want to send a million buzzing payloads to a parameter because you have like eight million parameters on a page, so it just takes forever to scan things, right? So M Matthias in his presentation like has this string, and I imagine a lot of buzzers, web buzzers, and scanners will start to pick up on this type of thing if they haven't already. Um, the idea of these multi-context injection strings. So this is awesome as well. Um, so for SQL injection, to, to kind of go through and fuzz things, I also use this project called the Sec List, Sec List Project. And um, it's got a whole bunch of Tits and fuzzing sex, lists in it. Huh? It was a fork of the FuzzDB, and then we added to it with like username and password lists and all this crazy stuff. Daniel Niesler here actually helped me um, curate it, and we designed it together. Um, and it's uh, it's invaluable, right? It's got like 
by uh, by type of injection. So if you want to just do like a login bypass in MySQL, it's got all those curated, all those strings curated that would you you would usually use to do SQL injection there. I highly suggest using this, and I just load these in the burp into Intruder when I want to attack a form or or something like that. Some parameter I think is uh, vulnerable. So. so other observations. Um, so blind is the pre predominant SQL injection. You hardly ever get error-based SQL injection anymore. Um, so like in those cases, you use like benchmark strings and stuff to make the page take a long time to load, and that's how you identify. Whether you take it the whole exploit way is uh, you know, it's up to you, right? We have a lot of researchers I know who just want to identify and move on, right? I like to, to run SQL map eventually because it's still king. I mean, there's no other tool that does it as good as SQL map. Um, and, that, and that's actually something I learned doing the research with everybody who SQL map at some point. Um, so yeah, uh, some tips for, for SQL map. Uh, basically, when you're doing this, you can actually par parse a whole burp log file. So like enable burp to do logging and then parse the whole log file and actually fuzz the whole log file with SQL map. It takes forever. It's not like the greatest way to do things, but it's also uh, offering a lot of coverage. Um, if you're up against some kind of like blacklist or something like that, it ha a SQL map has tamper scripts that you can use, which basically encode all of your attacks so that um, uh, you can try to evade blacklist. And there's a really good guide on there. Um, it's somewhere on the Bugcrowd forum on uh, DBM DBMS specific syntax for SQL map tamper strings. So if you're going up against MS SQL or MySQL or something like that, um, there's a simple string you can pass into SQL map and start fuzzing those parameters and get past blacklist. And then a really fast way to instrument um, SQL map is SQLiPy, which is a burp extension. And basically allows you to right click in any window in burp and send uh, that request to SQL Maps API running on your local box. So like you can just be inside a burp, right click, and start fuzzing the parameter it is if you need to. Um, so some common parameters and injection points like any ID value, currency values, item number values, uh, sorting parameters. I'm not going to go through all these. They're all on the slide. Like, And eventually this is all going to be on GitHub anyway, so you guys can just grab it and use it in your methodologies if you think it's useful. But um, these are the kind of places where we saw, the, where I saw the most injection, and where I, you know, my research parsed that in other places uh, showed me. This is SQLI Pi. So, right-click on a request, um, send it to SQLI Pi Scan, and uh, now that Burp renders um, scanner results in the target tab, but it doesn't look like this anymore. But um, you get the idea. So this is my cheat sheet of SQL injection resources when I do SQL injection, broken down by MySQL type. And these are cheat sheets that let you know uh, manual syntax um, based on uh, MySQL. A lot of these people are like, pen test monkeys lists are old. They're still the best. Like, you, you have to use these. And you have to have them handy when you're doing injection. So um, there's some really edge case ones at the bottom, like access, which, God, who uses access? That sucks. Uh, ingress, DB2, Informix, XQLite 3, and um, Active Record. Uh, for Ruby on Rails. So I keep those handy in my Evernote when I'm doing SQL injection testing and when I see errors or long load times or something like that, I just I start you know, getting in that mode. Um, so file uploads and, and file inclusion is, is the next area. So local file inclusion, the core idea is, is does it or can it interact with the server file system? Um, Liffy is, is my cool favorite tool for doing this. Um, obviously you can do it manually, so I have all of my LFI um, scripting stuff up on Seclis under fuzzing and LFI. So you can see here, like, I've, you know, I've tried a whole bunch of blacklist bypass or encoding to try to get common, you know, system files. This is on the Seclis project. Um, common parameters or injection points for this type of stuff is, like, you would think of this, but it's good to have it in the list. So, like, file, location, locale, path, display, load, read, or retrieve. These are the most common parameters that you'll find those in. Uh, malicious file uploads. So this is an important and common attack vector when doing this type of testing. Um, not only just to upload like uh, a Swift file and get XSS off of it, but um, you can also do pretty cool attacks. So one of the ones I like a lot, and it's a it's a DOS, basically an image that specifies itself to be super large but isn't. So it, you can upload it, and the server will write all this or will allocate all of this space for it on disk, but it's actually not that big of a file and you can DOS the application server using images crafted like that. There was a whole blog on it. Um, and then uh, you can you can actually, one of the things I think is interesting, I'm not gonna go into it too much, but there's a slide about it, is bypassing like security zones um, and storing malware on client servers. So there's 
as well as polyglot web payloads, there's also a polyglot uh, file, which can execute code in different contexts. Like, if you think of a parser reading a file, it can, you know, uh, it basically will look until it finds what it wants and then execute that. So you can create like a jar that is actually an executable. So if I make an executable that is malware, but I upload it to your server because you allow me to allow a jar, well, is that a vuln? Like, I don't know. Like, you are technically storing malware on your server for me, right? And I can send the black hats to go retrieve it. But um, can you do anything about that, right? Are you going to implement a parser to look through the binary data and cut stuff out? I don't think so. That's kind of hard to do. So interesting question there. It's kind of a, another road. Um, Dan Crawley did a presentation on it um, here at DEFCON. Uh, and it was That's fine. So you should check that out. Technical errors. That that came at the perfect time, actually. Oh wow. Okay, that's what we're doing. Yeah, we're doing shots. Okay. So uh, he's a, a first-time speaker, and uh, actually, the little story. Um, I guess he mentioned that uh, you were DEFCON, like, like DEFCON 16. DEFCON 16, he met someone. Uh, I, met, I met Julia, my wife here. He met his wife here. Yeah. So, you know, give him a hand, huh? <laughs> CSER bypasses, so common CSER bypasses 
uh, in my research yielded removing the token from the request, uh, removing the, the parameter value from the request, adding control characters to the parameter value, using a second identical CSER parameter, or changing the request method. Um, so check this out. This tool has gotten no love. I don't know why. I think it's been out for two years already. It's called Burpee. Have any of you used this tool before? Oh, good. Give you something to take away. Um, so what Burpee does, uh, you enable logging in Burp, and you crawl a site completely that has cross-site request forgery protection in it, right? Like a CSER token. And then you create this template and tell it what the token was, what a good result is for getting a page, what an error page looks like. And this template is actually really easy to edit. This is the sample one. This has been out for, I think, two years already. I don't understand why people want to use this. super sweet, right? So then you write this template. It's a Python script. And then you run this Python script burpee on your burp log file. And it re-requests all of those across the whole domain, every request that you've ever made in burp, re-requests with, with those first three attacks for CSER bypass. Then it produces an HTML report telling you uh, which ones gave different error messages, uh, which ones came out the same, and prioritizes CSER, uh, CSER bypass for you. So you made a lot of money doing this to Facebook and Twitter. Because it wasn't a uh, direct burp extension, it didn't get a lot of notice. I randomly found out I get other ones. So this is a part of the HTML output. Here's the base request. Here's the crafted, the first crafted request, and then the response. And then you get a report back saying it was the same. So um, I highly suggest that tool to the top. Another way to do it is just to check for every request across the whole book block file that didn't have the, the token in it, the actual parameter. Um, so this is another script that does that. It's another Python script that runs the book block file also that runs that protected kind of thing. So super sweet. Um, I use it all the time. I use it all the time. So CSERF just some common critical functions like add and upload file, you know, password change, email change, transfer money or currency, delete a file, edit your profile, uh, things like that. Uh, these are common so privilege, privilege, transport, and logic kind of get mashed into a section. Um, so privilege, you know, off and logic kind of get blurred a lot, but my testing thing is just, you know, the, if you have an administrative user, you need a couple accounts to do this, and then you have a low privilege user. And then, you know, the low privilege user just tries to directly call functions that are an admin, right? Pretty simple. But to automate that across multiple functions, um, you might need some tooling. So this is what I use for that. It's called Autorize. This one is available on the work store. Um, and basically, uh, you spider a site completely, you run through it, um, all of your post requests uh, as an admin user, and then you go through as a lower user, uh, and you give that information to Autorize, and you run the tool, and it tells you which one the lower user was able to access that the admin user was also able to access, and you can go through those and you work out there. Um, so common functions of use that, that I check for privilege escalation or anything like that, these can be actually combined with the last three sections. Add a user, within a user, start projects, um, change account info, uh, view customer analytics, so like there's a page that tells everything about whatever that site does, you want to try to that view, uh, payment processing view, like receipts, um, or any view with any PII on it, if you want to focus on that. This is what that looks like, authorized browse using a high privilege user. Log in with a low privilege user for pre request everything that you prioritize out. But cool. So, insecure direct object references is one of my favorites because I want a badass pair of gaming headphones uh, a couple months back. So, I started a, a bug in a, a really cool company and I had to disclose it and I ended up calling them on the phone and the help desk guy was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And, um, then I actually linked in spammed everybody at, of the IT group of that company and finally someone accepted I told them I'm not legit, I'm not like an asshole, I'm not extorting you, I just want to tell you this exists. Because I was buying a pair of headphones already. And um, they're accurate when they're on Then they fixed this bug. So, um, yeah, and so the, the receipt function basically was not great. You could just get you know, up and down and find other people's receipts and their credit cards. Um, and they sent me uh, two free pair of headphones, and I have one, and one goes to the game for this place, and I forgot to bring it up. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. But they're sweet headphones, I guarantee they're awesome. Um, anyway, so I do Okay, cool. 
So uh, increment, decrement, negative values, that kind of perform sensitive function, uh, function substituting user IDs, things like the user and how you test IDs. Um, these are common functions to user files that deal with IDORs. So uh, everything from the C search table, anything that says UID, password, or user hashes, emails, images, like that are supposed to be private. Um, so you can, you can go through the slides and kind of go through this. And all this is going to be up on GitHub if you have questions or whatever. So this is a simple IDOR. I don't know why I put a simple IDOR in here. This is definitely going to get something new. This. So you see like this numerical value, and you're like, oh, what happens if I change it? And you get someone else to see this is exactly what I did to another place. This was a disclosed bug um, at the back. So that they don't look at it. Transport, you need to enable HTTP everywhere. There's this awesome script that will uh, basically take up the blog file. Again, re-request every request in your site tree over HTTP instead of HTTPS uh, so you can see what's going over uh, in the secure channel. So instead of having to like, you know, sort columns and further and do all this stuff, I find this really useful. So I will just try to downgrade everything when I do report like this is the downgrade impact or whatever. Uh, logic, uh, logic logs, logic logs are usually pretty manual. Um, uh, the one I see a lot is substituting hash parameters where there's like prices or something like that, and they hash it and it's irreversible, or uh, there's just something to it that's irreversible or I'm too not to reverse it, right? But just finding another item that's cheaper, taking this hash and substituting it, and, uh, usually what it's like a compass payment or something like that. And so doing that is, um, usually yields the product for less money. Uh, so uh, step manipulation, this is like the bread and butter example that he gives for logic clause, like just multiple steps like order or put things in part, order, check out, pay, um, ship. You can skip everything or you like put everything in your cart and you ship because you have the you know, the whole process for you just you know, skip the process. Um, using negative quantities in uh, or using negative quantity for uh, uh, values. So I've actually had websites pay me credit because I put in a negative negative value on some price thing. Or or a negative quantity, right? Like order number equals one. Usually I want to buy one thing and I put in a negative twenty and I was like credit my account like seven thousand dollars or something like that. Um, application level docs. This one's kind of interesting, right? It's not actual DOS, right? I'm not advocating bug bounty like using a bot or anything like that, but I've seen some sites that just can't handle uh, just like uh, parsing a parameter with, you know, 40 zeros in or something, or me putting in like a math function that's a parameter value and the server's like, I don't know what to do, let me try to process this somehow and it just falls over. So those are interesting. And the timing impact of zero is definitely not possible. I mean, it's nice. You can check that out. Uh, mobile. Really running in. So data storage is really important to check these files for data storage as well as logging. This is the best tool to quickly get spun up uh, on iOS. It's called ITB. It's by Daniel Mayer. Basically, jailbreak your phone and install this tool. It gives you a full GUI list of handler of all of the files, all of the encryption values, if it's using exploit mitigation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's the most functional tool. Uh, I think it's partly based off a talk I gave um, a long time ago, and he made it in Ruby. And Sick. It's the best way to get into iOS testing that we've never done before. This is the thing about logs, we gotta go. Uh, this, those, other, those other volumes, I, I repeat them again, right? Like, don't just start with them, like content spoofing, referral leakage, search security headers, half disclosure. Keep them in your pocket later to escalate if you do so. Um, this is one idea of like, uh, you know, if I have five or thirty minutes or something like that, what can I do? So I tried to time myself with the methodology using this stuff in here. So in 15 to 30 minutes, I can do most of this using ERP and the automation, maybe an hour, like, it depends on how motivated I am, right? So these are like the steps I go through, I register, I, I hit the password reset, I go to all the forms that do security functions, I check the cookie, um, I do like a, all right, I perform enumeration on any like UIDs I see in the URL. Uh, I directory reports using one of the short lists in the background. I'd upload a file and head upload. And within 30 minutes, you know, an hour, I can usually find some pretty rough good stuff. Things to take with you. Crowdsource is different. Um, it's the same but different. Um, you find like 20% of the edge case stuff instead of 80%, and it, a lot of stuff goes quick. Data analysis is cool. You can probably do a 15 to 30 minute web test is done right. You can get some major homes. Sec list, polyglots are cool, and follow all of the bug bounty people on this bug bounty list. I put them all onto a Twitter list for you, and you can watch them hack things and talk about their content.
was also, there's a lot of stuff that didn't get put in here. Uh, there was a lot of data that I didn't get to parse. So 50% of the data is still unparsed. So I'm going to put it up on GitHub um, as a Git book, I think, or maybe just mark down. And um, you guys can contribute to it if you care enough. If you just want to take it and use it, that's fine. Uh, stuff to go in there, more tooling that I turn on. Uh, XMT, that's actually meant to say SSRF, a whole bunch of cool SSRF techniques. Uh, capture bypass, more detail on logic flaws, and to add Android mobile tools that, that I use often. 13 memes, is that okay? We good? Alright. Attribution and thanks. These are bug hunters who did researcher that, or these are bug hunters who did things in this presentation. All of them are super awesome. I respect every single one of them. Um, or who made tools. Um, and also my team at Bug Crowd, John, uh, Hodge, Ben, Ben, Grant, Fatih, Patrick, Katie, Kim, Abby, Casey, Chris, and Sam. Everybody in the book community, I love you guys. Uh, I love doing this for a day job. That's it. No questions, I see. Um, well, then that's it for this advertisement episode, and see you in the next one. Make sure to join. Laser Gonglet. Oh, I just realized um, I did not set up my um, OBS overlay yet. I, I built this thing. Yeah, maybe I should uh, do that for the next episode. Um, yeah, let's see. Okay, so um, make sure to join lgl.azithune.com. Let me manually write it since I don't have it overlaid. overlaid. Um, it's also in the description, and if there's a change of the IP address, make sure to check out, or if the server is down, make sure to check out um, the current website, which is cityhoon.com slash lasergurkenland. And if that is also down, make sure to search the interwebs for lasergurkenland and maybe the um, address changed and you will find something, um, yeah, more up to date on maybe like a newer video uploaded on this channel or, um, yeah, it's well, you most likely will find a updated URL or it's just a temporary downtime because I don't know the data center exploded and I haven't yet uh, recovered. Um, yes, so that's about it. Um, make sure to join the server and see you in game. Or if, uh, if you're still not convinced yet, see you in the next advertisement episode. Bye.